Okay. So, I don't know when uh, the last time you brought a friend with you to church. When, uh, when you bring someone to church for the first time, you notice things that other people or that don't notice and things that you've got used to. You know, you, you sort of notice and you, you, you bring your friend and you think, why isn't no one saying hello to my friend? You know, you, you notice some of the weird stuff that happens in worship that you think, I'm going to have to explain that now. And, and, and you notice like the, 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 the nutters that we kind of become used to, that, that actually now you're all of, all of a sudden you're, you're aware because you're seeing it through different eyes. When we get visitors here to church, we get visiting speakers. Often we'll get visiting speakers uh, or we get uh, other church leaders or people that I know of some experience of, of church life. And I often will ask them, tell me what you noticed. Tell me the things that you see, right? And, uh, uh, and, and often it's, it's, it's good and positive stuff. Sometimes there's stuff that you can kind of, you know, sort of adjust to and, and work out if you agree with it or not. But it's helpful to have an outside opinion. The Apostle Paul, right, when he comes to the church in Corinth, says this. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. I would say that's rough old feedback, wouldn't you? That's, that's a difficult pill to swallow, but that is exactly what the Apostle Paul says. And, and for him to say something like that, we've got to try and work out what it was that he was kind of having to go at. Because when we read a letter, and, and the letter to 1 Corinthians, this was literally a letter, we're getting kind of one side of a conversation, aren't we? And we, we're sort of overhearing half of the conversation and we need to try and work out what was, was going on with, with it. Now, the, um, I don't know if any of you have got any decent claims to fame. Any, anyone got a good claim to fame that they would care to admit? No, it's a bit sad, isn't it, really? Right, but Rachel's got one. My, my wife has got a great one, right? And this is true. She met Michael Jackson, Yeah? It's, it's good, isn't it? As, as claims to fame go, that's pretty good. Mine, less impressive, I'll be honest. Um, back in the 80s, there was a singer called Leo Sayer. Do you remember Leo Sayer? Yeah? Well, I met his mum. <laughs> right? And uh, that's, that's as near as it gets. At, at, at these meetings, right, that Paul is writing to, there was lots of sort of schmoozing going on. There was lots of sort of rubbing shoulders with, with people that have, were there of influence. And, and there was, because what would happen, these guys, the, the church in Corinth was a very mixed congregation. You had people from all sorts of backgrounds, different cultures, different sort of social settings. You had people there that were kind of landed gentry. You had, you had people that were kind of Hellenistic uh, uh, believers. They were Greeks and they'd come to know Christ. There was people from a Jewish background, and they were very sort of serious and, and, and came to this from a very Israeli way of thinking. You had slaves there, people that would be used to waiting tables for some of the people that they're in the same meeting with now. When they were having kind of worship times to different deities and different idols in Corinth, one of the ways they'd done it at these festivals is that they would have a big feast. And in this big feast, there would be lots of hobnobbing and schmoozing and sidling alongside people that you thought would do their career good. You know, there was, there was all this kind of, kind of networking going on. Think, if you like, some Masonic lodge or like, uh, like, like a golf clubhouse or something like that. The business was going on. There was, there was socialising going on and there was a religious veneer to the whole thing. And Paul says, that is what's happening with you in the church. And he says, it does more harm than good. Because you've got people there that are the, the lowest of the low in society. And they were being overlooked. And they knew their place. They knew that they couldn't kind of get the good seats in the meetings and stuff like that. Because they knew they was the lowest of the low. And Paul says, no, that's not how it is in the church of God." There's not good people and bad people. There's not successful people and unsuccessful people. We are children of the living God. 
and we come on the same footing. Whether you've got loads of money and loads of business and you're fully successful, whether you are a slave that's washing the feet of those normally that you are now uh, sitting next to in this meeting. When we look through the, the New Testament, there's, there's not a lot written about the communion, about the, 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 the bread and the wine, the broken body and the, the, the blood, shed blood of Jesus. There's not a lot of teaching in the New Testament outside of the Gospels. There, there, there's this passage in 1 Corinthians that we're looking at now, a few verses, but there's not an awful lot. But I tell you what there is an awful lot of, and that's unity. God has a lot to say about a unified people, about hearts that are knitted together, about not judging one another. The, the, the New Testament's got loads to say about this. Uh, and what was ironic in this situation, that this very kind of... Uh, um, thing that they did with the breaking of bread and, and, and uh, uh, drinking wine, this very institution that was meant to show unity as come out in the worship today around the sacrifice of Jesus was bringing great division. Now in, in verse 19 it says this, it says, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So what he's saying is, it's not wrong to have differences of opinion. Okay, within a church like this, within, within the backgrounds that are represented here, we will have different kind of emphases and different ways of doing stuff, different preferences, different theological kind of ways of looking at stuff, but differences are not the same as relationship breakdowns. They're just not. Um, when I was, I was looking to have some kind of visual sort of uh, uh, thing going on while I, was, while I was doing the preach. And I thought, oh, I'll get some bread. Now, when I, was, when I was a kid, back in the day, the choice of bread was this, right? Do you want white bread? Or do you want brown bread? Full stop. That was it. That was it. So it got a bit fancy as I started getting slightly older and you said, do you want sliced? We were really hurtling towards the 21st century then. But nowadays... If you say, go and get a loaf of bread, that's a mission. You need to be way more specific than that. Like I've, I've, I was just trying to make a list of it. You, not only white or brown. Oh, I've got another claim to fame. Uh, John Foster, do you remember the old Hovis adverts? Yeah, bread's better with now taken out. And that little boy pushing the cycle, some of you old enough, up the cobble streets. That was John. That was John. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> it's... Do you know what? If you're over 40, that's hilarious. But, um, <laughs> but, but th th these are the breads. I, I went in to buy a loaf of bread. I could have got whole wheat bread, seeded, rye bread. I could have got sourdough bread, multigrain. I could have got a baguette, ciabatta, chola, brioche, fat, flat bread, bagels, focaccia, cornbread, soda bread, naan bread, pita bread, muffins, banana bread, breadsticks, or garlic bread. But this was the smallest, and, and that was that sort of fitted in my coat pocket. So, so that was it. But we got so much choice. In the privileged West, we get so much choice in general. We get it about bread, but we also get it about churches. And so if you come here and you fall out, I say something controversial, imagine from the front, okay, you could get the ump with me, and there are 20 churches within a stone's throw of here that you can choose to go to. What happened in Corinth if you fell out with someone in church? Well, you had to make it work. You, you, you had to get on with it because it wasn't a lover church. You know, it was you was in church or you wasn't in church. And, and you had to make it work. We, are, we live in the privileged West with this, so many opportunities to choose. And, 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 and so you can pick and mix the bits you like. You know, you go to the supermarket and it's, we, we're amazed with like the kind of choices we have. You put the telly on and there's not three channels anymore. There's hundreds of channels that you can choose from. We're overwhelmed by choice. 
And what happens is it can so feed into the fact that the whole world is about me. When we come to break the bread, it reminds us that this whole thing is not about me. It's all about him. And, and as we break the bread, and we all get a bit of the same loaf, it's, it's like we all have a part to play, but we're all one. We're all one. And we, we get the opportunity to remind ourselves that it's not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about my choices. It's about him and his glory. Uh, over the years, I've had, I've had people come to me and say, I, I, I want to be accountable. I, I want you to hold me accountable. I'd like you to, I, I want to come under your covering. These are, you know, spiritual words. that People basically saying, I want you to make sure that I'm running hard after Jesus. And I, I do take that seriously when people say that to me, to the best of my abilities. But sometimes what you find is they are right up for that until you disagree with them. And, and, and then they can dress it up in all sorts of fancy words, but basically they just sort of say, look, uh, I don't really agree with you, and therefore I am, I am going to go. And, and the trouble is, it's like sometimes you have to sit down and, and say, say, look, this is what accountability looks like. This, this is what kind of, this is what um, uh, covering looks like. It's sometimes it is possible to disagree and, and not fall out. It really is. You are, you are able to have differences of opinion, and it doesn't mean that everything's falling apart. The Corinthians had to make it work. And, and, and like when we look at, at sort of what that means, for us here in the 21st century, in, in, in kind of modern society, with all the choices and privileges and options that we get, it's so much easier for us to just kind of skirt around or sweep stuff under the carpet or mind the eggshells. Jesus says, no, look, look at the bread. You know, look at this broken body. Paul says, your, your meetings do more harm than good. When you, when you look through history, particularly around the, 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 the breaking of the bread, there's been so much blood shed around it. Like, like it, it, I was reading between 1555 and 1558, 288 Protestant reformers were burnt at the... 288 were burnt at the stake for believing something about this bread. And, and, and one of the, the issues was that, that, that actually it was just a symbol. That when you broke the bread and the priest blessed it, actually it didn't become the physical flesh of Jesus because he didn't need to because that is finished. Okay, but it is a symbol. It's, and, and in the same way as I could show you a picture of my wife or one of my kids, and you know that that's not really them. That's a picture of them. That's a representation of that. When we break the bread and we say, this is the body of Christ, it's not the real body of Christ. It's a picture of what Jesus has done. He doesn't need to stay on the cross. That's why we don't have sort of crucifixes necessarily, because Jesus didn't stay on the cross. You know, he's, he's, he's broken, his body was broken, his blood was shed, he was literally physically nailed and died and went to the grave. But he did rise again. The cross and the grave are empty because he done it. We can get so kind of superficial about this. When we think 288, like, like the, the, the Queen, Bloody Mary, she, 288 were killed. Now, now, you had to really think about it when you broke bread in those sort of settings. For us, we could kind of, you, you know, we've got the bread there and the wine there, and we can sort of go, do I feel like it today? There's, there's, no, there's no burning going on today if you take this bread as it would have been like 500 years ago. But actually, I don't want us to lose the importance and the significance and the fact that if your life depends on this, would you still take this? There's, there's a superficiality about Christianity 
that is probably as, if not more, damaging to the Church of Jesus Christ here in the UK, in the West, than, than serious persecution that's taken on back, back, back in these days. Um, verse 21 says this, For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I, shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Well, what was happening there with all the schmoozing that was going on, with all the overlooking and the kind of one-upmanship that was taking place in this, actually Paul was challenging them that, that they needed to sort of care more about Jesus and less about the people around them. You, you don't judge people. You don't avoid certain types of people in the church of God. We, listen, the reason we're here, any of us, the, the reason that any of us think of ourselves as Christians is because we know that we were so soiled and stained by sin that we needed God himself to come and forgive us. That's how bad we were. When you have that as your baseline, you cannot look down on anyone else. You can't feel better about yourself and look down your noses at other people. When you know that you're a wretched sinner that's been saved by the amazing grace of God, how on earth can you cast judgment on other people and overlook certain types of people? This is a moment when we take the bread, where we, we remember that, that we are all there on the same, on the same page. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, the harshest things he had to say was to those that were inside the church that were, were living in a way that was contrary to what was glorifying to God. And what Paul was really most cross about was when the church started pointing the finger to those out there that weren't living up to the standards. Now that is... If you was to ask 100 people out in the street today, that is not what is seen by the church. They, they, don't, they see the church as judgmental of people outside and those types of people and those living in that sort of ways. And, and, and that's what the church is known for. And also tolerating a lot of rubbish within the church and sin that should have been rooted out. Totally contrary to what Paul is writing to this church here. Paul says, we, we, we mustn't have hypocrisy in the church. And how dare you look down on people outside that don't know the truth of the gospel. So how can they live any better? You don't judge people out there. You make sure your own house is in order. We cannot judge one another when we come to the, to the table in this way. Society changes. The communion does not. You had, you, had, you had powerless slaves and, and, and women and men in the same meeting. You had Jews and Greeks, and they all came, not looking down on one another. They were supposed to be there recognising Jesus' commitment um, there and then. Um, in verse 23, it says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Let me, let me just read that little bit again. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And, and when he'd given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance in, uh, of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. On the night he was betrayed, he set this up. So, so if you think that there are people that you've got the ump with in the room, or, or issues that you're struggling with in the church, on the night he was betrayed, he set this up. On the night that his best mates promised that they would never leave him and lay their lives down, only later on in the evening to run away when accused by a little girl of, oh, you was with them. 
or, or all, the, all the disciples left Jesus at this point. On that night was when he broke the bread and said, this is what I'm going to do for you, boys. You remember this. In years to come, you set this in motion because I want all my followers to know that on the night I was betrayed, I was still prepared to break my body and shed my blood for these people that would, I knew would let me down. I'd, I'd cleaned their feet earlier in the evening. I'd spoken truth to them. I was laying my life down. And all the while I was doing that, they was arguing about who was going to be the greatest, who was the most important. On the night he was betrayed, he broke bread and said, remember this. Remember this. I want, we, in a moment, we're going to literally do it. We're going to break bread and we've got like... Um, table at the back, and we've got a table at the back, yeah, and a table at the front, but I, I, I really, I really want you to take a moment, I, I actually don't want everybody in the room to take this, okay, now listen, after all I've said about not judging other people, I'm not judging you if you go up to the table and take the bread, or if you don't, all right, I'm making that very clear, actually, you have to stand before God yourself. You, you literally have to stand before God and say, am I accepting that when his body was broken, it was broken for me? Am I accepting that the fact that, that you know, 288 people were killed in three years because of this moment? I, I actually want you to take a moment to think about whether you want to align yourself with this if there was that threat of death, would you still want to go to that table and take a lump of bread and drink that, that wine? Because it's, it is a moment. It is a moment of sober reflection when we realise what, what it's all about. It's not about just a religious ceremony. Oh, this is what the Christians do, isn't it? No, no, this, is, this really helps us to to stop from all the, the, the noise of life, of all the options and choice and, and pressures and, and things that we think there is a moment today where you can choose to align yourself with that sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. That moment where his death brought us freedom. Where we, we actually do not have to go to the, to, to the cross anymore for our own sins, for our failings, for our inability to keep up with the standards that God requires of our lives. We no longer have to sacrifice ourselves because he has done it. And if you want to take the bread, this, listen, it's between you and God, but if you're doing it, you're saying this. You're saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have offended a holy God. And I recognize that the death that you, you died on the cross was on my behalf so that I could walk free. When, when, when I take this, this, this cup, this, this wine, this fruit of the grape, I want, to, I want to acknowledge that your blood was shed so that mine doesn't have to be. Your blood was spilled on the altar as a sacrifice, so that mine doesn't have to be. I can live in the freedom of that. When you take the bread and you drink the wine, you are saying that, Lord, from now on, I'm living for you. I'm aligning myself with the, with the church. I'm aligning myself with you. I'm calling myself a Christian. I'm following you above all else. All other gods, all other ways of thinking, Lord, I surrender to you. And And... As I, I, I want to invite you to take the bread and to drink the cup. And, and in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come up. And, and if, if you want to take part, then, then you, you take it. And then take the bread and the cup back to your seat, just on your own. And we'll just have a moment of quiet and, and a moment where we sort of are just able to, to reflect on the fact that we're not looking down on anyone else because we're gazing up at the cross. And at the cross is this beautiful sacrifice that I needed because I was so dirty. And, and we'll take a moment 
and then we'll, uh, I'll pray and then I'll invite you to all to eat the, the bread yourselves and then we'll drink the wine and then I'll hand over to Evs. Is that okay? Okay, so I just want to invite you, listen, and I mean it sincerely, take it seriously. If you want to take the bread, fine, and, and the drink, fine. I want to encourage you to do that now, but don't feel you have to. Don't do it for peer pressure, please. Okay, those of you that want to, please move.